All right, thank you very much. And hello again, radio friends. How in the world are you? You doing all right today? Sure, I wait for you to answer, and many of you do, I know, because you've told me so. <laughs> we don't have two-way communication here, but, well, as the song says, though sundered far by faith, we meet around one common mercy seat. We belong to our blessed Lord, many of us, and those of you who don't yet belong to him, I urge you this very day to commit yourself to the Lord Jesus Christ so that you can become a member of the family of God and know that your destination is heaven and that your sins are forgiven and that Christ lives in your heart by faith. Great to belong to the Lord, isn't it? Oh, yes, it is. Well, this is your good friend, Dr. Cook, and I'm glad to be back with you. We are commenting, just a brief comment on the chapters in Mark. We finished our verse-by-verse -verse discussion of it, and uh, now we're just sort of commenting on these chapters before we leave this precious book and go on to some other portion of the Word of God. Chapter 5 of Mark deals with the various kinds of fear that people have in connection with their relationship with the Lord Jesus Christ. There's the fear of the changes Christ will make in the life. And there's the fear of <clears throat> disclosure. Uh, what if people find out about me? And then there's the fear of ultimate failure that would uh, break your heart if you failed. That's, that's the outline of, uh, of that chapter. Here's the man who is the, uh, the uh, maniac, they called him. He was inhabited by not one but many evil spirits. And his outcry as he saw the Lord Jesus was, Don't torment me. Don't, don't torment me. Uh, why? Why was he so afraid? Did the Lord Jesus ever torment anybody? No. But there is that innate fear among the, the uh, demons and the, the lost people of this world that if you have any dealings with a holy God, you're going to lose out, you're going to be tormented, you're going to be uh, unpleasantly treated, and you are going to lose what you have. Uh, I was present at a, uh, at a uh, commencement, a, a college commencement in Gaocheng, where... Uh, the um, different students had a word to say, and this one young man gave such a fine speech. And afterwards, I spoke with him. He spoke English quite well, for which I was grateful. And I said, you know, you ought to be a preacher. Well, he said, perhaps someday I shall, but you know, he said, I'm not a Christian. Oh, I said, why not? He said, well, I'm afraid that I couldn't uh, leave uh, Buddhism. I'm afraid. See the change. Well, I told him, you uh, lay aside your fear momentarily and just talk to the Lord Jesus and ask him to come into your life and he'll settle the question of Buddhism for you. Well, that seemed to be a new concept for him somehow. It's quite simple really, isn't it? But it seemed to be a new concept for him and he said, I shall do this. I trust that he will. Fine young man, brilliant and uh, the leader of his graduating class, but not a Christian because he's afraid of the uh, changes that might come in his life. Now, the simple fact is, uh, dear friend, that you don't have to fear the changes God will make. They said of our blessed Lord, he hath done all things well. Abraham prayed in his prayer, shall not the judge of all the earth do right? See, our basic assumption is that Almighty God always does things right. Whatever he does is right. And uh, uh, Solomon said, I know that thou canst do everything and nothing can be withholden from thee. Whatever the Lord doeth, it shall be forever, another passage says. So your basic assumption as you face any relationship with your Lord is he'll always do the right thing. He'll always do the right thing. God having prepared some better thing for them, it says. Anything God does is not only good, but better for you, and turns out to have been the best. It shall be for our good always if we observe to do according to all that he has commanded us, said Moses. Now, there, I think, lies, therein lies a, a great truth that will uh, help to uh, steer your own decisions <clears throat> as you go down through the road of life. 
Oftentimes you, you have that built-in feeling that is common to all of us fallen sons and daughters of Adam. Adam and Eve had it. He was afraid that, that God was going to, uh, to keep him out of something he might otherwise enjoy, and Satan worked on that. And now, after the entrance of sin into the human race, Adam said, I was afraid and hid myself. To be afraid of God is part of the awful price of sin that the human race pays. But you don't have to stay that way, dear friend. You can come boldly, the scripture says. Let us come boldly to the throne of grace. Why? Because it's not a throne of judgment any longer. It's a throne of grace. Our blessed Lord Jesus Christ has paid the price for our sins. He suffered for us. Christ also hath once suffered for us, the just for the unjust, that he might bring us to God. And so it's a throne of grace where God welcomes you and forgives you and, and brings you into the, the heavenly family. And, we're, and now then, John says, we are sons of God. And if sons, it doth not yet appear what we shall be. Beloved, now are we the sons of God. It doth not yet appear what we shall be. But we know that when he shall appear, we shall be like him, for we shall see him as he is. Paul says that we're children of God. And if sons, then, then heirs, joint heirs with Jesus, our blessed Lord. And you don't have to be afraid of God. You don't have to shrink back and say, well, I, that, uh, that's not for me. Yes, it is for you. Blessed, wonderful fellowship with your blessed Lord. And don't be afraid of the changes that Christ may bring in your life. What if I become a Christian, someone is saying? What will it do to my marriage? What will it do to my job? What will it do to my relationship with the rest of the family? What will it do to my relationship in the community? Don't worry. God doesn't do anything except good. And everything that happens will be for the good and for the glory of God. Let us come boldly to the throne of grace. You don't have to be afraid of God, nor indeed of what he will do in your life. Remember that scripture that I quoted a moment ago. They said of our Lord, he hath done all things well. And so Fanny Crosby sang, For I know whate'er befall me, Jesus doeth all things well. All the way. My Savior leads me. What have I to ask beside? There you have it, my dear friend. You don't have to be afraid of those changes. Then there was fear of disclosure. The lady who had been ill for so many years. Uh, and nobody could help her. Twelve years she'd been ill. And she'd suffered many things of many physicians. Spent all she had. Nothing better, rather worse. Mark is very frank about it. Luke is a little more... A, a little more kind, and has what we call professional courtesy. He said that she could not be helped by anybody. <laughs> That's the doctor talking. But Mark, he said, no, she wasn't any better. She's rather worse. Anyhow, she said, if I can only touch even the hem of his garment, I know I'll be well. Well, she did. She forced her way through that crowd, and that wasn't an easy task, ill and weak as she was. But come on through the crowd and find, uh, finally, getting close enough, close enough. She touched the hem of his garment, and straightway it said she felt in her body that she was healed. Well, Jesus knew what happened. He looked around, he said, who touched me? <laughs> the disciple says, you've got to be kidding, Lord. Everybody's touching you. Everybody's shoving and pushing. No, he said, somebody touched me with the touch of faith. Well, the woman fearing and trembling. See, there you have the fear of disclosure. What if people find out? She came and fell down before him and told him all the truth. Key word there is all. Told him all the truth. And he said unto her daughter, Thy faith hath made thee well. Go in peace and be well from your plague. Fear of disclosure. It's a false fear because the Lord Jesus Christ doesn't want to expose you. He wants to reassure you. If that lady had gone away without ever facing our Savior, she, there would always have been that note of uncertainty 
And there would always have been the fear of what if people find out what I did. He doesn't want to expose you. He wants to reassure you. Can you get hold of that truth, beloved? Can you get hold of that wonderful truth that God is not in the business of embarrassing you, but of reassuring you so that you can face life unafraid? There's such a difference, isn't there? Now, how do you start this? Some, uh, well, I, I suppose everybody listening has something that you wish you could change in the history of your life. Isn't that true? How do you face all of this? You go to your blessed Lord and you level with him. It said it told him all the truth. The first step in being reassured in your faith and in your relationship with the Lord is to level with him and tell him all the truth. Now, there are some things in your life that are nobody's business but yours and God's. I don't believe in Christian exhibitionism, so to speak, and in dragging everything out before public gaze. I do believe in Christian honesty before God. I believe that you should tell God exactly what the score is. Tell him exactly who and what you are and what you did, what happened, how you feel, and all of it. Because, John says, if we confess. Now, that word confess in 1 John 1 9 is, is a Greek word that means agree with, say the same thing. Homologeo, to a compound word meaning to say the same thing. All you're doing actually is agreeing with God because he already knows what the score is about you. And he said, if we confess our sins, he is faithful and just to forgive us our sins and to cleanse us from all unrighteousness. Say, dear friend, what you and I have to do, first of all, is to level with our Lord and tell him all about us. And when you do that, he does cleanse, he does forgive, and he makes it possible for you to face life unafraid. Go in peace, he said. Go in peace. He makes you, it possible for you to face life unafraid because you know that you and your Lord have set things straight. Dear Father God, today grant to us, instead of being afraid of thee, to come boldly to thee, pleading the grace and the mercy of our Lord Jesus Christ. In his name I pray, amen. Till I meet you once again by way of radio, walk with the King today and be a blessing. You've just heard Walk with the King, the ministry of Dr. Robert A. Cook. This program is listener supported. For more information or to find out how you can help continue this ministry, write to us at Walk with the King, P.O. Box 43, Trumbull, Connecticut, 06611, or visit us on the web at walkwiththeking.org. Thank you for your support of this ministry. This has been broadcast number 6,632. Thank you for listening to Walk with the King. All right, thank you very much. And hello again, dear radio friends. I use those words advisedly. You are dear to me. Some of you I shall never see until we get to glory. Others of you I've known for many years. But I want you to know that God has fastened you securely into my heart. The heartstrings, as we call them, are tied together in a Calvary knot. The love of God shed abroad in our hearts by the Holy Ghost who has given unto you. Yes, you're dear to me. That's not just talk. You care about this ministry and I care about you, even though we've never met. It's part of the miracle of what we call Christian fellowship, Greek word koinonia, sharing of the very presence and, and power of the risen Christ. Thank God for it. I'm glad it's true. Aren't you? We've been looking at the 91st Psalm. <clears throat> you want to go on with me and look at some of those verses? We finished verse 4. His truth shall be thy shield and buckler. Your shield and your bulletproof vest is the truth of God. All you have to do is proclaim it and live it. If you don't live it, your proclamation isn't going to mean much. Now he says, <clears throat> Thou shalt not be afraid for the terror by night, nor for the arrow that flieth by day, nor for the pestilence that walketh in darkness, nor for the destruction that wasteth at noonday. Here you have it. Terror, arrow, pestilence, destruction. This covers the areas of human fear. Has it ever occurred to you that all the different kinds of fear are met by trust in God? It certainly is a fact that you don't stop being afraid just because somebody tells you not to. When I was a little boy, I was afraid of the dark, and someone 
in whose home I would be staying, most often it might be my Uncle Frank Setzler, would come stomping up the stairs, having heard this whimpering little boy up there in the dark, fling open the door of the bedroom in that farmhouse home and say, What's the matter with you, boy? You shouldn't be afraid. You're a big boy. Now go to sleep. Don't be afraid. Slam! And the door would close and he would go downstairs. You know, that just blessed me to death. No, it didn't make me stop being afraid at all. You don't cure fear by a lecture. You only cure fear by a person. When somebody's with you, that can handle the situation, then you don't have to be afraid. Would you stop to realize, beloved, that God is the personal cure for all kinds of fear? Well, what kind of fear? There's the fear of the unknown, terror by night. You go to bed and you think, are all the windows secured? Are all the doors locked? What if somebody breaks in? What if there's a fire? What if, if there's something happens in the wiring and there's an electrical fire? Did I turn off the oven? What if and what if? And then there's a, a, a bad storm rumbling outside. You think, what if there's a tornado? And the wind blows so fiercely that it rattles the windows and shakes the house. And now and again, as it happens, you, you know, we live up uh, at, at quite an altitude. I think it may be 1,250 or more feet above sea level. We are about halfway uh, as high as uh, the Camelback Mountain that, uh, that the skiers use. Uh, we can see it out our windows, see them coming down in the wintertime, coming down to break their legs and their ankles. <laughs> oh, dear. You know, I have to say I have never learned to ski because it seems to me so uh, so uh, frustrating to get on two pieces of wood and start down an incline with the sure knowledge that you're either going to fall down or hit something. <laughs> well, you know, I'm just kidding. Some of you skiers are positively beautiful the way you slalom down the hills. But anyhow, we are uh, high enough up that we have a little altitude where we live, and I'm glad the the air is clear and good, and I enjoy it. But the, by the same token, when there's a storm, you're high enough up so that you're closer to the electrical discharges that cause the the thunder. And do you know something? When when there's a bad thunderstorm, and the lightning hits somewhere near, the thunder is loud enough. To, to make the, the 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 pictures on our walls jiggle and and get skewed, so we have to go around and straighten them all. Actually, the house actually shakes uh, with some of those thunderclaps. Well, you get used to it after a while, and you know that's what it is. We're talking about terror in the night. What if somebody breaks in? What if there's a burglar? What if there's a, a a criminal out there? You've heard on the on the radio or the TV that there's an escaped convict in the area. What if he chooses your house to break into and to hold you hostage? And you don't feel well and your heart is beating erratically and uh, skips a beat now and again. You think, what if I have a heart attack? What if and what if and what if? The terror by night. Yes, we've gone through it, you and I, haven't we? What do you do about that? Well, the Bible says, I will both lay me down in peace and sleep, for thou, Lord, only makest me to dwell in safety. From somewhere I got a sweet little story about two children who had been put to bed, and it was dark, and they were discussing all the different things that might happen. A little boy and his sister, who was maybe two years older than he, Let's say they were about maybe three and five or something like that. And they were sharing the same bedroom and uh, talking across the room, each from uh, his or her bed. And so finally, the little boy said, I'm scared. And he said, what about the lions? His imagination was working and he thought there might be some lions around. What about the lions? And from across the room, his sister's voice came in that clear, childish treble. What about God? Oh, that does it. What about the lions? No, what about God? For thou, Lord, only makest me to dwell in safety. 
Do you have some unnamed fear in your heart? Many of us do from time to time. You know, you, you think as the years go by, what, what if I have a stroke and I, and I linger for months or even years, unable to move, and I'm a, I'm a burden on my loved ones and all that? What if, what if I have a heart attack? What if, and what if, and what if? Unnamed, faceless terror. What do you do about it? Fight it? No, just turn it over to your blessed Lord. Thou shalt not be afraid for the terror by night. Nor, he says, for the arrow that flieth by day. Here is, is deliberate attack. Arrows are shot at a target. And here is deliberate attack. You don't have to be afraid of, de of deliberate attack by somebody else. Aren't you glad that's so? You know, it does seem as though there are people in the world that don't realize that you and I are as nice as we really are. <laughs> I'm always surprised when somebody attacks me because I'm such a nice guy. <laughs> yeah. The arrow that flieth by day. Deliberate attack. Yes, it does happen. I had a man say to me years ago, I'm going to get your job, and he went to work at it. <laughs> well, he didn't get it. <laughs> God took care of me. I'm his boy. But uh, it does happen. And always we think, oh, what am I going to do now? Listen, friend, thou shalt not be afraid for the arrow that flieth by day. Suppose there is a deliberate attack made upon you by somebody. What then? Just trust your blessed Lord. Just specialize in obeying him. He that dwelleth in the secret place shall abide under the shadow of the Almighty. Under his wings shalt thou trust. Thou shalt not be afraid. Specialize in obeying God. Let him handle the arrows. Oh, that's a precious truth, isn't it? Then he says, you won't be afraid for the pestilence, pestilence that walketh in darkness. Disease comes. What about it? The pestilence that walketh in darkness. Disease. What if I contract some great disease? What if cancer hits me? What if diabetes hits me? What if I succumb to high blood pressure? What if I have a heart attack? What if arthritis cripples me so that I'm all crippled up in bed and can't move a muscle? What if? Disease. Now, this is a very real thing, and I'm talking to some people who already have become the victims of, of some illness or other, and you're anchored, aren't you? You're there in, in maybe in a nursing home or in your own home as other loved ones are caring for you. And here is this man, Cook, and he's still able to get around and he's feeling fine, and he has the nerve to say to you, you don't have to be afraid of disease. And you say to yourself, Cook doesn't know how I feel. He doesn't know how I hurt. How can he say that? He doesn't know what I'm up against. I realize that, beloved. And it's true. I can't feel exactly what you feel because I don't live inside your skin. And some of you dear ones who are listening have a rough time of it. And you're hurting this very moment, and if it weren't for the merciful administration of Percodan or something else to keep the pain level down, you'd be climbing the walls. I know that. And my heart goes out to you. Now then, if that be so, and it is so with you, how do you reconcile this, thou shalt not be afraid for the pestilence that walketh in darkness, the diseases that hit us? Well, I have to point out something, and you may not agree with me, but he says you won't be afraid. It doesn't say you won't hurt. He says you won't be afraid. And God either will remove the burden from my back or strengthen my back so I can bear it. He says, take my yoke upon you and learn of me. For my yoke is easy and my burden is light. Yes, there are things that we have to go through. Sorrows hit us and we cry. Sorrow and heartbreak is real. Just because you're a Christian doesn't mean you're not going to cry when somebody is taken from you. Yes, illnesses come to us. I believe in divine healing. I have prayed for people and seen them healed. I've also prayed for people and they died. So I believe in divine healing at the, at the command of the Almighty. 
We leave the outcome of the prayer to the God who hath done all things well. If ye being evil know how to give good gifts to your children, how much more shall your heavenly Father give good things to them that ask him? He'll give you bread, not a stone. He'll give you fish, not a not a snake. He'll give you an egg, not a scorpion. He'll give you what is good for you in answer to your prayer. I believe this with all my heart. So I believe in divine healing, but I also know that God allows some of you, dear saints, God bless you. My heart goes out to you this instant. Some of you dear ones are hurting so terribly in your body. What is the answer to it? He says, thou shalt not be afraid. You specialize in honoring God and he'll make you a blessing in the situation. Who always causeth us to triumph in Christ and maketh manifest the perfume of his knowledge by us in every place. God wants you to be his perfume even when you're in the crusher. God wants you to be his perfume, even when you're in a situation that seems intolerable. Thou shalt not be afraid. Under his wings shalt thou trust. Oh, I hope that's, uh, that's of, of help to somebody today. Bless your heart. My heart goes out to some of you who have, have such real burdens to bear. May God be real and precious to you this moment and all day long. Dear Father, today, help us to specialize in trusting Thee so that we can be victors in every situation. Through Jesus Christ, our Lord, I pray. Amen. Till I meet you once again by way of radio, walk with the King today and be a blessing. You've just heard Walk with the King, the ministry of Dr. Robert A. Cook. This program is listener-supported. For more information or to find out how you can help continue this ministry, write to us at Walk with the King, P.O. Box 43, Trumbull, Connecticut, 06611, or visit us on the web at walkwiththeking.org. Thank you for your support of this ministry. This has been broadcast number 6,650. Thank you for listening to Walk with the King. All right, thank you very much. And hello again, radio friends. How in the world are you? You doing all right today? Oh, I trust so. Bless your heart. You know, <clears throat> we never can anticipate what kind of a day it's going to be, but you can always be sure that God is there. He's the God who is there. He's the God who said, I will never leave thee nor forsake thee, so that whatever kind of a day you have before you, or night as the case may be, because we're heard during the late evening hours on some stations, Whatever kind of a day or night you have before you, beloved, you can be sure that God is there. He's not going to fail you. Trust him. Yield your whole life to your blessed Lord and let him run it. No regrets when Jesus leads. Well, you and I are looking at John chapter 11, and we've discovered the fact that after the message concerning the fact that Lazarus was sick, after the message came, the Lord Jesus stayed put for two full days. He was operating on a different schedule than human expectations might have led you to believe. After that, after two days, <clears throat> he said to his disciples, Let us go into Judea again. His disciples said, Master, why, those people sought to stone you. And are you going back again? They were trying to kill you. You going back again? Now, humanly, he ought to stay out of danger. That's, that's the human reaction. If they're trying to kill you, don't go back and give them another chance. A small thought here. There is no law against using good sense. If you know that something you eat is going to make you sick, don't eat it. If you know that you are racing your motor and, and, and going too hard in your schedule, slow down. You're not required either to blow up or bust up or, or whatever, you know. Uh, Wendell Lovelace, who at age, I guess, nearly 100, recently went to be with the Lord, my dear friend through many years, said to me one day, when I was just out of school and going like a house of fire, uh, doing the best I could, he said, now, he said, uh, you, ought, you ought to learn to relax and slow down a little now and then. Oh, I said, I don't want to rust out. He said, yes, but you're not required to bust out either. <laughs> no, there is no law against using good sense. 
But there are times when you look at what is involved and you decide that it is worth the risk because of the need to do God's will. It is worth the risk because you are in the business of doing what God told you to do. When God tells you to do something, do it. John 2, 5, whatsoever he saith unto you, do it. All right, now that being so, you come back then to this text. The disciples said, listen, use a little sense, don't you? Why, why, not, uh, why not stay out of danger? Well, he said, there are 12 hours in the day, and if you wait until the night, you're not going to be able to see where you're going. In effect, he was saying, I have to do what I have to do while I have a chance to do it. He was marching, although they didn't know it, straight to Calvary. And everything that was to be done before that had to be done. You couldn't wait until another year. That was the point he was making. So let me stop here long enough to emphasize the fact that when God puts something on your heart to do, don't say, I'll get at it next week. Someone handed me a little wooden uh, coin, a little round wooden coin about as big as a quarter. And on it were the, the letters T. U-I-T. And uh, I asked the person, I said, what is this, T-U-I-T? Oh, he said, that's a tuit. Well, I said, what is a tuit? Well, you can see, said he, that it's round. Uh, you've always been saying you wanted to get around to it. <laughs> I'll do it when I get around to it. Yes. Don't put off the word of God. Don't put off the will of God. You won't get a second chance to do the will of God. Well, I can't say won't because Jonah got a second chance, didn't he? And lots of the rest of us have been forgiven of our shortcomings and, and errors and failings, and God has kept on graciously dealing with us. That's for sure. But I'm talking now about the timing of God's events. Some things don't happen again. And you and I need to obey God with the immediacy of knowing that this is God's time. Now is the accepted time. Would you form the habit of immediate obedience? You'll find that it serves you well. So what our Savior actually was saying, yes, I know it's dangerous, but Lazarus is worth it, and I'm going straight to Calvary, and Calvary's worth it. That is what he was saying. Now I come here then to ask myself and ask you this question. Who is there and what is there in your life and in your plans that is important enough for you to give first priority to it, even though it may involve either risk or danger or disappointment or all of the above? Lazarus is worth it. Yes, I know they tried to kill me. Yes, I know they'll try again. Yes, I know they'll be successful after a few days. All of that is true, but Lazarus is worth it. Let's go. What is there in your life that has the highest priority concerning which you say that is worth it all? Now, I don't need to know what you're answering, but you and God need to settle that. For many people, the priorities are amazingly secular. And they have to do with everyday living and things and the money to buy them, with family and relationships, with hopes for children and grandchildren, and all of that. Dear friend, sort out the priorities and make sure that if you're going to take a risk, you take it for eternal matters. Does that make sense? Make sure that if you're going to take a risk, as indeed our Savior was, that you do it for matters that are eternal, for precious never-dying souls, for the will of God, for the privilege of walking in God's daylight. That is the basic priority.
Hmm. Well, I'm looking now at the, the passage that goes from verse 9 to verse 14. And uh, he says, our friend Lazarus sleeps. And they said, why? If he's asleep, he's a good new fine. And he had to explain that to them. He said unto them plainly, verse 14, Lazarus is dead. And I'm glad for your sakes that I was not there to the intent you may believe. Two things. Number one, he says, Lazarus is dead. Now he was still at the Jordan. They hadn't left yet. They hadn't left the Jordan, and it was going to take them two more days. He had stayed two days after he heard the message, and then he stayed two, two more days. And when he got there, Lazarus had been buried four days. So he says, Lazarus is dead. He knew already that the possibility of healing that poor sick body was gone and that the man had died. Um, could I remind you something, beloved? We have in, in management what we call worst-case scenarios. You corporate officers, you know about that. You figure out the worst thing that could happen, and you write a scenario about that as to what might be done if the worst thing you can think of happens, and you go on from there. This was a worst-case scenario. The man was sick, and now he's dead. Where do you go from there? God is greater. Now listen to me. Some of you need this. God is greater than the worst case scenario you can ever imagine or experience. He's greater. Jesus knew already that Lazarus was dead. But he was able to say, Lazarus is dead, and I am glad. It's an amazing statement, isn't it? Lazarus is dead, and I'm glad. Glad for your sakes, because what I'm going to do is going to strengthen your faith, and you're going to believe. Now, can you get hold of this? Time will run out before I can chew on it very much, but I just want to go over it with you so that it fastens in your own mind. Beloved friend, listen. I know that many of you are going through the ringer. I know that many of you have your problems, physical problems that have angered you or that pain you so deeply. You're suffering all day and all night long. You wonder, how long can I stand it? Family problems where husband or wife is straying and the home threatens to break up. Uh, Parent-child problems where children are rebellious and out with the wrong crowd and you're afraid they're on drugs and may get into crime and all of that and your heart is just breaking over it. Job problems, where there's been a reshuffling of management and you're being shuffled out and you wonder what's going to happen with you. Educational problems, where you're wondering which college or, or uh, seminary or Bible school uh, to uh, enroll in, and uh, you're having difficulty getting to the one you want and you don't have money enough anyway. All the different kinds of problems. All of the worst-case scenarios you may say, would you believe today, would you take into your own heart this concept? God is already there. He knows the worst case, and he's bigger than that. He knows the worst that can happen, and he's bigger than that. Greater is he that is in you than he that is in the world, so he's bigger than the devil. In the world you shall have tribulation, but be of good cheer. I have overcome the world. He's greater than the world system in which you live. He's greater than your troubles. Thanks be unto God, which always causeth us to triumph in Christ and makes manifest by us the perfume of his knowledge in every place. God is greater than the worst case you can imagine. Look up today, my friend, out of your troubles and out of your pain and out of the difficulty and out of the job situation and out of the family problems. Oh, look up and trust your blessed Savior and tell him once again that you are trusting him and that you want to obey him and listen for the voice of the indwelling Holy Spirit to guide you as to the next step. God will not fail you. He will see you through just as our Lord Jesus followed through to a glorious conclusion with Lazarus. By raising him from the dead, so our blessed Lord will see you through the worst case scenario. Trust him. 
Dear Father, today may we trust Thee for Thy guidance and Thy perfect plan in all that goes on. In Jesus' name, amen. Till I meet you once again by way of radio, walk with the King today and be a blessing. You've just heard Walk with the King, the ministry of Dr. Robert A. Cook. This program is listener-supported. For more information or to find out how you can help continue this ministry, write to us at Walk with the King, P.O. Box 43, Trumbull, Connecticut, 06611, or visit us on the web at walkwiththeking.org. Thank you for your support of this ministry. This has been broadcast number 6,890. Thank you for listening to Walk with the King. All right, thank you very much. And hello again, radio friends. How in the world are you? Doing all right? Well, I wish you'd come with me now, please, to Psalm 107, and we'll go on in our study of that great psalm that deals with how and when and why people pray and what happens as a result. Oh, that men would praise the Lord for his goodness and for his wonderful works to the children of men. This is verse 21 now that we're starting in. Let them sacrifice the sacrifices of thanksgiving and declare his works with rejoicing. They that go down to the sea in ships that do business in great waters, these see the works of the Lord and his wonders in the deep. For he commandeth and raiseth a stormy wind, which lifteth up the waves thereof. They mount up to the heaven, they go down again to the depths. Their soul is melted because of trouble. They reel to and fro and stagger like a drunken man and are at their wits and then they cry unto the Lord in their trouble and he bringeth them out of their distresses. He maketh the storm a calm so that the waves thereof are still. Then they're glad because they're quiet. So he bringeth them unto their desired haven. Now the key to that, that passage is the phrase they are at their wits end. You people who, who do a lot of sailing and boating, or some of you who are professional sailors and work on the ocean liners or whatever, you know that, that uh, you get a certain routine established in managing a, uh, a ship or a small boat. There's a routine established. You know what to do. In other words, if you have a sailboat, you know how to, uh, to trim the sails. You know how to duck when they when the uh, yard arm comes across there so you don't get your head bashed in. You know how to tack into the wind so that you take full, full advantage of the way the wind is blowing. If you are, uh, if you are uh, driving a power boat, you know very well that before you turn on the motor, you have to ventilate the uh, engine compartment, get all the gasoline fumes out of the bilge, Many a person has blown himself up because he started the motor without ventilating that engine compartment, right? And so you have a routine established. First, turn on the little exhaust fan motor that ventilates the engine compartment. Or maybe even, as some of my friends do, open the two doors on top of the motor and uh, let the air in and let the fumes out so that there's no danger whatsoever of an explosion when you start the motor an explosion from accumulated gasoline fumes that may have seeped out of the carburetor during the interval when the boat was not used. And then you know how to edge the boat away from the dock. You know that there are certain rules in managing it, either in rough and choppy water or in busy traffic. In other words, you've got a routine established, haven't you? That's the, that's the way to be a, a safe and... and uh, and healthy <laughs> sailor. You learn the routines. Oh, of course you do. And the same thing is true in all of life, isn't it? You get along well if you learn how things are done. Of course. Well then, what happens when, when something occurs that breaks across the process of routine and it's something that I don't know how to handle. Here he uses the illustration of a person at sea. The stormy wind, the waves mount up, and they are such high waves that the, that the ship seems to go up toward heaven and then goes down toward the depths. Have you ever been on the ocean in the midst of a heavy storm? 
and uh, perhaps you were on an ocean liner or perhaps some of you in the military were on a destroyer or a cruiser or one of the bigger battle wagons. And so the, the waves were mountainous and you watched the bow of the, uh, the ship as it went up and up and up and up and up and you thought surely it's going to turn over, but no, it didn't. Now it starts down again, down and down and down and down, and you think it's going to take a nosedive right straight down to the bottom of the ocean. No, it doesn't. The, the waves wash over the uh, ship, but uh, it recovers again and starts the whole process over again. Does that bring back any memories to any of you? <laughs> well, that's what, that's what the Bible's talking about here. They, they mount up to heaven. They go down again to the depths. Their soul is melted because of the trouble. Well, life is that way sometimes, isn't it? It does seem as though some of the experiences through which we go are just like a storm on the ocean. And the little craft of your life is tossed to and fro. And you think, oh, this is it. It's going to capsize. Or else, as you go down the other side of the wave, you think, oh, I'm going straight to the bottom. Well, you're at your wit's end. You don't know what to do next. You don't know what to do next. Then what? says, then, then they cry unto the Lord in their trouble. And he bringeth them out of their distresses, makes the storm a calm, and brings them to their desired haven. Now I'm talking to somebody today who's in the midst of the storm. And you say to yourself, well, Cook doesn't know what I'm going through. It's all right for him to talk, but he doesn't know what I'm going through. And you know, you're right. How can I know? I don't live inside of your skin. You know, and God knows, but how can I know uh, in the same way? At the same time, I've lived a while, and I've been through some things, and I know that some of the storms in life can be awfully rough on you. And you get to the place where you can't hurt anymore, and you get to the place where you can't cry anymore, and you get to the place where you just don't know what to say anymore. And you sit and look at the situation and you shake your head and you say, I just, I'm at the end of myself. I don't know what to say or do next. It's the way it is, isn't it? Oh yeah, I've been there. And some of you are there right now. Now what do you do? It says they are at their wit's end. Then they cry unto the Lord in their trouble. He makes the storm a calm. He brings them to their desired haven. Now, if you'll pray in the midst of a wit's end corner situation, remember the old poem that said, are you standing at wit's end corner? Well, if you'll pray in the midst of a wit's end situation, two things will happen. God will ease the storm. And second, God will show you direction in your life. In answer to prayer, beloved, there is always one step that you can take. I've found that out. When you pray about a trouble or about a situation or about a, a problem or about a storm in your life, when you pray about these things, God may not change everything all at once. But what he will do is to suggest to you by his Holy Spirit one thing that you can do by way of obedience. And if you'll obey him in that, He'll go on and show you some other things. If we walk in the light as he is in the light, we have fellowship one with another. When I was a little boy on the farm, I used to have to get up and help with the milking at four and five in the morning. And you know, in the winter time in Ohio, five in the morning is still pretty dark. And it seemed a long way from the house to the barn. And it seemed awfully dark. Now, when I went back there some years later, I was amazed at how everything had shrunk. <laughs> have, you ever, have you ever tried that? Go back to, to a childhood scene, which you remember as being so large. And when you get back there, you find how small it is. <laughs> well, I was amazed at how everything had shrunk. But I do remember those childhood journeys to the barn at four or five in the morning in a wintry time when it was very dark and the snow was very deep and you couldn't see from the house to the barn. But what I could see was the glow of the lantern that was held by my Uncle Frank. 
and he, with his long outdoorsman strides, would be walking along ahead of me, making a sort of a path through the newly fallen snow, maybe half a foot or a foot of it there. But he had the lantern, and I kept my eyes on the lantern and followed along in, the, in his footsteps, and I got there, safe and sound. If we walk in the light, thy word is a lamp unto my feet and a light unto my path, says the wise man. And you, my friend, and I can uh, have, have the, the blessed experience of taking one step in the light and finding then that there's another and another and another because God will give you guidance. Have you learned that yet? Whenever you pray, there are two things that will happen. First, the steam goes out of the pressure cooker, so to speak. The storm begins to abate in its effect upon your heart and life. And second, you get a sense of direction, something that you can do about it. Dale Carnegie says that worry is the absence of an organized plan. If you know what you're going to do next, you don't worry. And so it is with the believer. If you and I will commit our stormy situations to God, he'll tell us what to do next. And the worry goes out of the situation. Isn't that great? I want you to try that in your own life today, beloved. Some of you are in such stormy and upsetting and heartbreaking situations. I know that. But today, would you just talk to the Heavenly Father? Would you just ask Him for His mercy and His blessing on you and ask Him to, to calm the storm? And then would you wait before Him long enough for Him to give you a sense of direction. You'd be surprised at the way worry goes out the window, the storm seems to have abated, and you now have a sense of being guided, as this passage says, to your desired haven. To your desired haven. God gives you a sense of direction in achieving the things that are dearest to your heart. Delight thyself also in the Lord, and he shall give thee the desires of thy heart. If you specialize in wanting God's will, he specializes in giving you what your heart really wants. Isn't that a beautiful thought? If you'll specialize in doing God's will, he'll specialize in satisfying your heart. Oh, let him do it. And sometimes, just to be frank about it, you don't know what to pray, really, about the storm, about the need. Catherine Marshall says that there was one situation where she was so perplexed, she didn't know what to say or do, and so she just lifted her heart to God and said, Oh, Heavenly Father, in Jesus' name, have mercy, have mercy on me and on so-and-so. And she named one of the members of the family that was involved in this particular need. She said, Have mercy. Heavenly Father, on me and on such and such a one. And she said, strangely and wonderfully, that situation began to mend, and God's hand was seen. And so, dear friend, if, even if you don't know what specifically to pray, cry out to God and ask for His mercy. Ask Him to take control of the situation, and then listen carefully for His guidance as He tells you the next step to take. Dear Father, today, calm the storm and direct our lives. We ask in Jesus' name, amen. Till I meet you once again by way of radio, walk with the King today and be a blessing. You've just heard Walk with the King, the ministry of Dr. Robert A. Cook. This program is listener supported. For more information or to find out how you can help continue this ministry, write to us at Walk with the King, P.O. Box 43, Trumbull, Connecticut, 06611 or visit us on the web at walkwiththeking.org. Thank you for your support of this ministry. This has been broadcast number 7,524. Thank you for listening to Walk with the King.